So today, guys, I'm gonna read two ayats from Surah Fajrat, ayats 13 and 14. I'm gonna read it, and then after that, for the people who don't speak Arabic, I'll translate it, translate it for you. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا to safeguard the Muslim community against social evils. In this first verse, the whole, the whole of mankind has been addressed to reform of the great evil that has always been causing universal disruption in the world due to faith, due to race, colors, language, country, nationality, and gender. However, all of you are created by one God. We have been created by the same substance and are all one family that started with the first couple, Adam and Eve. But our population has grown and made us split into different countries, which some of us insult and made their language. And the regions created and the regions created made different races and colors. So next time think about when you make fun of a Christian or a Muslim or a black or white person. This is why Allah or God loves loves the one who has taqwa. The kind of people who have tuffle are purification in their heart, reverence, reverence and awe, certainty in God, patience and contentment, and thanks and appreciation for God's favor. But God is the one who has the highest rank and is inferior in the respect of quality and characteristics. The standards of high and low that the people have set up their own accordance and isn't approved by Allah. Maybe the one who says he has high rank has actually the lowest judgment by Allah, and the person that mankind says has really low rank attains high rank in Allah's judgment. The only honor and dishonor comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah, you know, Ayyub is a very, very brilliant and funny person. You didn't see that, you know, the funny part. But you can see it another day. But thank you so much for the... Alright, so now... Uh, uh, yeah, one, another... So another uh, Marvel View participants, uh, yet. Yeah, you want to present the speaker? She needs a microphone for this one. Can you give her a microphone? Assalamualaikum. So, how are you all doing? Good. 
Projecting my voice. Tonight we are going to talk about a concept that my company chooses, chooses to call the three gaps. But before we talk about the three gaps, we have to talk about three relationships. Without these relationships in place, your ability to live a happy and productive life, to make a difference in the lives of others, is going to be severely limited, if not impossible. I had the opportunity before he passed away a number of years ago, actually almost three now, to be one of Stephen Covey's joint authors. So I've known Stephen and Dr. Covey for a number of years, and I had an opportunity to work on projects like the Eighth Habit. So I spent a lot of time around Stephen, and I heard things that aren't included in his books. So here's something Stephen said a lot that's not found in any of his books. I need you to listen to it, and then tell me if you think this is an accurate statement. Here's the statement. The quality of our lives is a function of the quality of our relationships. The quality of our lives is a function of the quality of our relationships. In other words, if my relationships are good, my life is good. If my relationships are poor, my life is going badly. Is that a fair statement? Yes. If that is true, and I believe it is true, then let me suggest to you that there are three relationships that are foundational to living a quality life. I have had the opportunity in the last 35 years, as we were talking about, to travel all over the world. I have about four and a half million airline miles. I have been on the road all over the world an average of 238 days a year for the last 31 years. So I have learned a lot of things, but really just one thing. And that is, as we heard in the reading, very well done, Lord, that we are all children of the same God, that we are all the descendants of Adam and Eve, and that we are all very, we're just similar. We are just people. We were talking about on the drive down here being in different parts of the world, and the reality is we're all just people. So I believe that everything I'm going to share with you tonight has nothing to do with anything other than just being people. These are the three relationships. The first relationship is foundational. If you do not at any age, oh, by the way, I should back up and tell you this. Where I worship, I have for the last, you know, 17 years instructed first the 12 and 13 year olds, and now the 16 and 17 year olds, so I'm used to talking to you. So I'm gonna to try to be practical, but I'm also gonna to try to be mature. 
The Scottish philosopher Thomas Carlyle is very famous. He's quoted all the time here in America. He said something that people say so often they don't think about it. Here's what he said. Knowledge is power. I think that's one of the dumbest things that a human being has ever said. It's dumb. It's a, it doesn't make sense. If you live in the first world, as we do, it is impossible, I would suggest, not to know that smoking is bad for your health. And yet people continue to smoke. Why? Because if knowledge was power, then knowing that something was wrong, you would expect everybody would stop doing it. Knowledge is not power. Carlisle is wrong. Wisdom is power. And wisdom is the humble application of knowledge. Knowledge only gains power through the portal of humility. It doesn't matter how much information you are exposed to in life, how much access you have to the internet, how much you learn, if you do not, first of all, test that learning, and then where it is correct, apply it. This is where the first relationship is rooted. Regardless of your faith or worship, the first relationship essential to living a good life is your relationship with God. If you do not center your life at any age on your relationship with God, then you will not be humbled. Knowing God is the foundation of humility. Humility is the necessary foundation of changing our lives consistent with truth. So it doesn't matter how much you learn if you're not humble because it's just information. Humility is what allows it into your life and allows you to then reflect on your behavior and say, I need to change. I need to improve. I need to make adjustments in my behavior. And I don't care who you are, as I said, anywhere on this planet, this is the foundation. Knowledge acquires power through humility. Humility is the, content, is the outcome of recognizing God. So that is the first relationship. And so when I talk to secular audiences who, who do not claim this particular faith, they say, well, I don't believe in God. And I say, that's fine, but you must believe in something greater than yourself or you will always think you know enough never to change. So that is the first relationship. The second relationship is the relationship with your elders, with those who are older you, than you. Primarily your parents and secondarily all of your elders. Here's one of the mistakes we make when we're young. We think that everything that has gone before us is broken and that all good ideas are ours and as soon as we get old enough, we'll change the world and finally make it work. Right? That's known as the arrogance of youth. <laughs> but the adults are all nodding, but know this. When we were your age, we were arrogant youth. We were doing the same thing to our parents. We were sitting there going, they have no clue what they're talking about. Let's just hurry up and make sure they get out of the way, and then we'll change the world and make it finally work. Let me introduce you a concept, and I ask permission to mention this word, because it does not come from either your faith or mine. It comes from a Chinese faith called Taoism. And in Taoism, there is a concept that says, and is better than or. Here's what that means. I can respect my parents and my elders and the things they have done and I can make changes in what I do with my life. See, or thinking says, in order for me to be right, my parents must be wrong. In order for me to make a difference, I must reject my traditions. That's or thinking. And it basically says, the only way for the new generation to be right is for the old generation to be wrong. And the minute you divorce yourself, from the previous generation, from your parents and your elders, you're in essence trying to start everything from scratch. And that is just foolish. 
There's no other word for it. It's just foolish to start from scratch when it's not necessary. Now, as an adult, have I done things wrong? Yes. Will I continue to do things wrong? Yes. But I learned from my grandparents who learned from their grandparents who learned from their grandparents. And the goal is not to start from scratch. The goal is to build upon that which is already in place. Albert Einstein was once asked, who is the greater physicist? You or Newton? Because that's a legitimate question if you study Einstein and Newton. That would be a legitimate question. It would be a legitimate question nowadays to ask Stephen Hawking, who is the greater physicist, you or Albert Einstein? But in this case, Albert Einstein was asked, who's the greater physician, physicist, you or Newton? He said the following, this is absolute genius, and it's an illustration of the idea of and, that we can, as young people, change the world by building on the things our parents and elders have done. Here's what he said. The dwarf sees farther than the giant when he stands on the shoulders of the giant. Think about that. The dwarf, you know, dwarf, very small, sees farther than the giant. Now, if the dwarf was standing on the ground, they wouldn't see nearly as far as the giant, right? Their, their view would be blocked. The dwarf is who? Metaphorically. It's you. It's the person who's building on, yes. It's the new generation. You are, in essence, the dwarf, with apologies. <laughs> and no slander on dwarfs. <laughs> but you cannot see as far as your elders simply because you don't have the life experience to see as far. You don't have the context to see as far. Now, on the other hand, the giant has limited vision too. So Einstein says, let's put the dwarf, the new generation, on the shoulders, on the experience, the wisdom, the teachings of the older generation, and they will see farther and they will be able to take us to the next place on, on the path of life. The dwarf sees farther than the giant when he stands on the shoulders of the giant. Do not make the mistake. Many of you are between 13 and 17, so I'm warning you right now. Do not make the mistake, as you prepare to become adults, of thinking that all adults are fools. If you do, you will reject what they want to teach you. You will have to start from scratch. And you will endure pain and struggle that's completely unnecessary. Just because you think in or rather than and. Does that make sense? So the first relationship essential to making a difference in life is our relationship with God because it creates humility which allows us to turn knowledge into action. The second relationship is the relationship between the rising generation and the older generation. You think in and. How do I take everything my parents have taught me, everything my elders have taught me, everything scripture wishes to teach me and use that to confront a new world driven by the internet made up of artificial intelligence uh, self-driving cars all of that that's the second key relationship okay relationship with god relationship with your elders third relationship is your relationship with yourself one of my favorite sayings is a very simple saying two words Know thyself. A lot of people, especially in a social media world, are so caught up in deciding that who they are is a function of how other people see them. So if other people say I'm attractive, then I'm attractive. If other people say I'm intelligent, I'm intelligent. But if they bully me, especially on social media, and they say I am worthless, I'm not intelligent, I'm all kinds of terrible things. If that is where you look for your definition of self, you will always be at risk of running into the next bully. Always be at risk of running into the next bully. If on the other hand, you can learn to look inward and discover who you are in the context of your relationship with God and your relationship with your elders, then you can tolerate 
the negatives that come to you from the world around you. When I first started at Franklin Covey, I was one of the founders of the company, but I wasn't a speaker. And the person that we had hired, his name's Lenny Rouse, he's a friend of mine now, who was looking to train our speakers. I said, Lenny, I want to speak. He said, you can't. I said, why not? He said, you are too short and your voice is too high. You could never make a difference as a speaker. So I moved to Canada where he had no authority and began speaking. <laughs> Lenny is tall and he has a deep voice and he's the most boring person you've ever heard speak. But see, he had in his mind that you had to look and sound a specific way in order to be acceptable in a certain job function. If I had listened to Lenny Rouse, I don't know what I'd be doing today, but it wouldn't be this. Lenny was wrong. I had to look internally and say, you know what, I'm pretty confident I can do this. I don't know if I'm really good at it, but I'm confident I can learn to do this. So you have to learn to look inside. And what I'm going to give you now are the tools to look inside and to improve your relationship with all three groups, with God, with your elders, and with yourself. These, I believe, are universal norms. I don't know anyone on this planet who does not need those three relationships to be healthy. I need a healthy relationship with God. I need a healthy relationship with my elders. I need a healthy relationship with myself. With those three relationships in place, or at least starting to grow, I can work on being happy in life. Here's what I want you to do. You've got, got something to write on? No one will see this but you. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is, I'm so miserable I can barely stand it. Y'all familiar with Winnie the Pooh, that story? Yeah. Okay, okay, so let's just do this. Eeyore is never happy, correct? Eeyore the donkey, he's always miserable. Let me just talk about Eeyore for a minute because he fascinates me. Those of you who are Winnie the Pooh experts, you can help me out. Where do all the characters in the story Winnie the Pooh live? What's that area called? The Hundred Acre Wood. It's a giant area and it's a hundred acres. You have an idea of how big an acre is? Big area, right? So Eeyore could potentially go anywhere on those hundred acres. Okay, second question about Eeyore. Where does he hang out? There, it's a house, but where's it in? A thistle patch. Remember, he lives in a thistle patch. You know what thistles are? Weeds. Barbed weeds. Horrible things. So he could live anywhere he wants, and he lives in a thistle patch. Now, would that make you unhappy, living in a thistle patch? Yeah, so he's unhappy. He could leave at any time, but he doesn't. Now, what does he eat? Don't work too hard on this. Thistles. That makes you twice as miserable. Now, there's another reason he's miserable. In your mind, picture Eeyore. How's his tail held on? Like, like a tack or a nail, right? If I nail the tail onto your, onto your backside, would that make you miserable? Yes, it would. See, he's like three levels miserable. He lives in a thistle patch, he eats thistles, and his tail's held on with a nail. He's miserable. So, if you feel like Eeyore, you would give yourself on this rating a scale of a number one. Now, who's the exact opposite of Eeyore in Winnie the Pooh? Winnie. Winnie? And even more than Winnie? Tigger. Remember Tigger? Come on, everybody knows Tigger, right? Tigger's, Tigger's the little tiger, right? Do you remember his soft... Now, Tigger is the opposite. He's never in the thistle patch. He's bouncing all over the whole woods, right? He gets caught in the trees, falls down in the heffalump trap. If you know this story, he's always everywhere. But he's always happy, right? Always happy. Do you remember the song that he sings? Wonderful thing about Tigger is Tigger's are wonderful things. Their heads are made out of rubber. Their tails are made out of springs. Remember that song? He's happy all the time. He would give himself a ten. So here's what I want you to do. No one will see this but you. Give yourself a number to represent your current level of happiness. 
Are you closer to a number one or are you closer to a number ten? Nobody sees it but you. Come up with a number or? Come up with a number. No one sees it but you. On a scale of one to ten, ten being so happy I can barely stand it, and one being so miserable I can barely stand it, what number are you? Okay? Now you don't have to share it. All I want to know is this. Did anybody give themselves a ten? Good. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> For the rest of us, we have a gap. We have a gap. We want to be happier. I'm going to show you how to be happier most of the time. Now life is difficult, there will be challenges, but I'm going to show you how to be happier most of the time. Now why do, you, why do I want you to be happier most of the time? Because happiness is infectious. People who are happy go into the world with a completely different attitude. They go into the world to make a difference, to lift others, to make things better. People who are Eeyores go wake up every morning miserable and they go about making everybody else miserable. They get on social media and they post how miserable they are so that we can all read that first thing in the morning and have a great start to our day. Oh, ice is miserable. Perfect. I was going to be happy today, but I guess today we're going to be miserable. See, here's why happiness matters. About, I don't know, five or six years ago, the high school where we live asked me to talk to the ninth graders. Do we have any ninth graders here? Ninth, tenth? Ninth? Okay. Asked me to talk to the ninth graders. I said, what do you want me to talk about? They said, anything you want. I said, that's not a good idea, but I'll go. So I stood up in front of all the ninth graders, and their parents were there, their teachers were there, and I want you to imagine I said this. I said, welcome to the ninth grade. A lot of what you learn over the next few years is completely irrelevant to life. You'll never use it again. This is when all the parents started to pay attention. They're all like... <laughs> and then I said, so that you don't waste the next three years, let me tell you what you really need to learn when you're a teenager to have a very successful and happy life. I said, you only have to really learn two things. You have to learn how to create energy. That's the first thing. What do I mean by that? The quality of your life, how happy you are, your ability to make a difference in the world, is a function of the level of energy you wake up with every day. And by energy, I mean physical energy, spiritual energy, emotional energy, mental energy. Energy is what feeds activity. So the first thing you've got to learn how, and learn it as early as you can. Don't wait till you're 50 to learn that energy matters, you have to learn how to create energy. So then I said, how do you create energy? It's really quite easy. Energy is created by good habits. That's it. Good habits create energy. Bad habits destroy energy. Here's a good habit. Go to bed early. Get a real night's sleep. You all know it because you've all done both the right thing and the wrong thing. When you get a proper night's sleep, whatever that is for you, you wake up with energy, Yes, you do. When you play video games till 2.30 in the morning, if we can even get you awake, you wake up miserable because you have no energy. Now, it's not just physical energy we care about. We care about emotional energy. For example, being kind to others creates emotional energy. That's a good habit, being kind. Being a bully, being negative to others, destroys energy. It destroys your ability to connect to other people. Things like study, prayer, fasting, feed spiritual energy. Anger, frustration, disobedience destroy spiritual energy. It's just about energy. If you are angry at someone, resolve the anger, or it will suck energy out of your life. You will take energy you could use to make a difference and use it to be angry. So the first key is, you got to learn how to create energy. For example, I love to get up early. I was born on the farm, so when I was a kid, we got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. 
I now consider that sleeping in. I get up between 2 and 3 in the morning every single day. How do you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning? I wake up naturally. That's it. You go to bed at 7 or 8 o'clock at night. I still get 78 hours of sleep. Now, I know that's kind of dorky, go to bed at 8 o'clock at night, but it's worth it to me because how many people are up at 3 in the morning? Them. So I can pray and read and meditate, which I do every morning, in absolute silence. I get, before the rest of my family and friends get up, I get four to five hours of personal time to study, to read, to prepare for the day, to do things that matter. It improves the quality of my life. Now, I'm not suggesting you should get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, but I would suggest you should get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and that you should have a healthy, gentle start to your day. So you, you, live in, you live in the New Jersey, New York area. Nobody has a gentle start to their day here. People wake up to an alarm, immediately check their email, so they've got 50 things to be stressed about, <laughs> grab some completely unhealthy snack, run for the school, the bus or, or the train or transit, and immediately throw themselves into school or work, and then they, after six months of this, they go, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just, you know, this modern life is out of control. It's not out of control at all. You're out of control. Human beings aren't designed to be woken up by a buzzer and thrown into the day. Even if you could get 15 or 20 minutes, it would be great. Just enter the day gently. Don't enter the day aggressively. It's critical. So the first key is developing good habits. The second key is channeling the energy those good habits create. Once you have all this emotional, physical, mental, spiritual energy, don't waste it on stupid things. You know, much of that which is forbidden to us in our, in our worship, in our theology, in our upbringing, is forbidden because it destroys energy that could be invested in doing good. So it's great that if you get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, but if you get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to spend an hour and a half on social media, that might be a waste of that energy. So the key is, I told these high school kids, just two skills. Learn how to create energy and learn how to invest it better. You'll be happier, you'll make a difference, you'll have a better life. So now we're going to talk about how to invest the energy. This is where the three gaps come in. There are three things that take energy and invest it into happiness. And those three things are, number one, Living our values. When we live our values, those things that are most important to us, those things that represent our highest priorities, we are happier and we make a difference in the world around us. So let's say that, well, I have come up with, for myself, six values. I'll share them with you. These are the six things that matter most to me in life. Number one, protecting and caring for my family. This is my highest priority in life. When I make a serious effort to protect and care for my family, I'm happier, I'm obviously making a difference, and I have lots of energy. When I get caught up in the busyness of life and don't invest in my family, I feel guilty, I feel miserable, I feel depressed. I'm losing energy. My first value is protecting and caring for my family. My second value is gratitude. I want to be grateful. Gratitude covers a multitude of sins because it creates a, a context for recognizing you don't need more in life. You actually have more than most people ever have. Our son served a mission for our church in Eastern Africa. Uganda, Somalia, Tanzania, Kenya. And he sent me an email, this was a number of years ago, he sent me an email and he said, 
Dad, guess what we use tires for in northern Uganda? Car tires. I said, I don't know, cars? He said, no. He said, a group in northern Uganda, who called himself the Lord's Army, tried to recruit by force kids to fight for them. If they refused to fight, they amputate their arms and legs. Now, because these are not medically amputated, they don't heal properly. And they don't have enough money to buy wheelchairs or crutches or those kind of things. So they take old tires and they cut them into segments and they lash them to the stumps that used to be their legs and their arms so they can pull themselves across the ground to live their life. Now, do you see why we don't need more? As difficult as our lives may be, I cannot even conceptualize doing that. And here's what Jonathan said. He said, not only do they do it, Dad, but they do it happily. Because they're grateful to simply be alive and to have not been recruited into this horrible situation. Well, you know, you start thinking that you're having a bad life because you didn't get everything you wanted for your birthday. I want you to think about car tires and be a little more grateful and just recognize that, you know what, not getting an iPhone 6S does not constitute persecution. You don't know it. We don't know it. So gratitude is my second value. My third value is kindness. I think that the simplest gift we can give each other every day is just to simply be kind. Life is hard. It is hard for many people. It is hard for some people a lot of the time. So be kind. Be gentle with people. It doesn't cost anything. My next value is integrity. I believe you ought to keep your commitments. When Hiram called and said, can you go do this at work and then do this in, in uh, New Jersey, I said, absolutely. They then canceled all the flights out of Austin. <laughs> so I had to get from Austin to Dallas to catch a plane to Atlanta, to catch a plane to, to Philadelphia. It was a little bit of a torture, but every time I started feeling sorry for myself, guess what I said to myself? Tires. You know, because I got into Dallas in the middle of the night, and guess what? When I got into Dallas in the middle of the night, I could afford to take a cab over to a nice hotel to sleep for four hours. Now, I could have been miserable and said, but I only slept for four hours. Guess what? Tires. And then I got on a plane and flew here, and now I get to be here with you. Because when you make a promise, you simply keep your promise. You don't try. You simply keep your promise. If you can't keep it, don't make the promise. And uh, Hiram and I have known each other for almost four decades, so if Hiram says, I need you to do this, you just do it. Just what you do. Another one of my values is the defense of truth. Truth is a very squirmy, wiggly thing because everybody thinks they have it and very few of us do. The only way I've figured out to find anything close to truth is by interacting with people. I don't claim to know much about Islam, but I know enough not to be a bigot. I was, uh, we were talking and I said, you know, way back in the 1980s, a book that is very offensive to Islam came out, the Satanic Verses, and everybody was reading it and was talking about it, and I said, well, you know what? I think before we decide what Muslims believe, we ought to ask them what they believe. And one of the things I did, and I did it in English, so it doesn't really count, but I read the Quran twice. Because I don't think I should form an opinion on any group of people without making an attempt to understand their view of the world. You see, I'm a Mormon. A lot of people think we're really weird people. In fact, in 1841, the Congress of the United States ruled that Mormons were non-humans. Which meant that you could not commit a crime by murdering, raping, or taking our, our stuff. So that's when we moved to Utah, because Utah was a part of Mexico. And we left so that we could survive. So we know what it's like to be persecuted. So we know what it's like to not make assumptions about people without interacting with those people. Those are my values. Now what I want you to do is begin a little exercise with me on your values. By the way, when do I have to be done? No, 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 no. What's the rule? What time is it? 7.15. 7.15. We can't go until 
It's 8.30, okay, everybody? We probably won't have to go that long. Well, we'll take a break. <laughs> no, because I really want to get to bed. i got to leave at 4 in the morning. Um, here's what I want you to do. Take a sheet of paper, and I'm going to take you through an exercise. It's a three-part exercise. Nobody sees what you write but you, so don't show off. Write what you really feel. Number one, I want you to list three or four things that are a high priority for you in life. Three or four things you really care about. Now, really quick before you do that, let me tell you about our daughter, daughter Rachel. So those of you who are younger will know that you need to be honest here. Our daughter Rachel cares about nothing more. She's now 32. She cares about nothing more than animals. She likes animals more than people. When she was a little girl, she had all kinds of pets. You know, pets we knew about, like dogs and cats and fish and birds. And lots of pets we didn't know about that she would rescue in the wild and hide in her room. One day on her way home from school, she was crossing the road and she heard this sound in the ditch beside the road. And she went to investigate and it was nine baby raccoons. Their mother had been killed by a car and they'd been left abandoned at the side of the road. So Rachel being Rachel, she dumped her school books into the ditch so she could empty her backpack. She then smuggled home nine baby raccoons and put them in a box and raised them under her bed for almost three weeks until I went in and said, because her room usually smelled of animals because she had so many pets, but I'm like, there's something different in here, Rachel. And she wouldn't tell me. Rachel will do anything for animals. I was saying that we, she had a horse when we were growing, when she was growing up. And lots of times, we couldn't find Rachel in her room. We'd panic, you know. She's like five or six years old. Where's Rachel going? She's out sleeping in the stall with the horses. So if you asked Rachel what are her values, number one on her list would be caring for animals. Nothing is more important to Rachel than caring for animals. So write whatever you want. Three or four things that are really important to you. Nobody sees them but you. You can write down as many as you would like. I just did three or four for those who only do one. Okay, so you got at least three or four? Now I want you to pick one of them, just one of them, and write one or two sentences describing why that's so important to you. So pick any one of them, and in one or two sentences, describe why whatever that is is so important to you. Remember, this is private. Nobody sees it but you. Get you started tonight, so you, I, I'm hoping you'll do some more work on this because we're going to move pretty quick. Now, number three, I want you to go back to your list, and I want you to number the items on your list in order of priority. On that list, the most important thing to you, you'll put a number one next to. Remember, for me, it's protecting and caring for my family is my number one. What is your number one on your list? What is your number two, number three, etc.? Has everybody got a number one? Then I have a question for you. How much time in the last week 
did you spend investing time and energy into that thing? Or do you have a gap? See, a gap is when something's important, but I'm not spending time on it. See the gap? This is what's important. This is the time and energy I'm investing in it. Well, if my family is important, and I'm not interacting with my family at all, then there's a gap. That gap is the opposite of happiness. You want to be happy? Decide what you value and start investing time and energy in it. Now, as you spend more time and energy on it, you'll be happier. But I'm going to tell you there's a downside. To spend time on that, you're going to have to stop spending time on something else. And for some of us, that's difficult to do because we've become addicted to the something else. For example, to sit at the dinner table and talk with our family, important if you value your family, talking to them, you cannot be on your phone. See, because when you're with your family, but on your phone, your value and your behavior are not answered. They're not consistent. So you say, no, I really love my family. I want to spend time with them. Okay, so put down your phone and talk to us. Now, as you talk to your family, you will feel better, but there'll be this pull of your old habit that says, but I'm on my phone. And this one will say, but I love my family, but I'm on my phone. And this sometimes takes a lifetime to master. It's like people who say, you know what I value? I value financial security, but I like stuff. Well, you know what? You have to buy less stuff so that you free up money to be financially secure. But it'll always be this pull. Oh, I'm feeling more financially secure. I'm happier. But I don't have as much stuff. And of course, many of you turn on the TV or go to the mall, guess what they tell you? Don't worry about this. Buy stuff. And so this happens all the time. The gap closes and the gap opens. But I want you to start paying attention. You know when the gap is closing. You know when you're living your values. How do you know? Don't overthink this. You're happier. As you list, clarify, which is what the sentences are, they're called a clarifying statement, and put priorities in your life and start to live in line with them, you'll feel happier. Now, once again, you'll have these other habits that keep pulling you away, but you can break those and as you get happier, here's the weirdest thing of all. Some of us then start feeling stressed that we're not miserable anymore. We've actually got so comfortable being miserable that when we're happy we go, this isn't right, I'm usually miserable. And so it's just weird, we get all messed up in our heads. It's like people who say, oh, I'm so stressed, I wish I could worry less. So then they learn how to worry less, but then guess what they do is they worry less. They're happier, but they worry that they're not worrying. This is how faith works. People say, you know, you have to develop faith in God. Well, the minute they start to trust in God, they stop worrying. Because they're not trusting in God. And then they go, this isn't right, I'm not worrying. And they start worrying that they're not worrying. And I'm like, it's called faith, you need to let it go. Oh, but I'm, I'm actually more comfortable being miserable. It's just bizarre, we're all screwed up. This is my view of the world, by the way. There's no facts to this. This is Richard Gottman's view of the world. There are only two people in the whole world. Two groups of people. Only two. You ready? Messed up people who are ready to talk about it. And messed up people who are not quite ready to talk about it. There's no such thing as not messed up people. We're all messed up. The trouble is, we all sit in a room like this, and you know what? We look around and we think, Oh, I wish I was like her. I wish I was like him. I wish I was confident like her. I wish I wasn't smart like him. And we think that these people are all together and that we're the only messed up one in the room. Guess what they're doing? They're looking at you going, I wish I was like you. I wish I was smart like you. I wish I was outgoing like you. We all think the only messed up person in life is us. Here's the good news. We're all messed up. Every one of us. That's why we're supposed to help each other. Because there's no perfect people walking around. We're all train wrecks. Great thing. Okay. This is called the values gap. The values gap is closed through two activities. Number one, you just started the first one. You make a list of your values, 
You write about them and you put them in priority order. That's the first step in closing the values gap. The next step is you look at your life and you say, am I doing the things I value? If the answer is no, I know where you're unhappy. And I know how to make you happy. Start doing the things you value. Just start doing them. It will require some sacrifices. You're going to have to let go of some bad habits. Start doing the things you value. You'll become happy. It's really not that complicated. We love to make life complicated. <laughs> Number two, second gap. This is known as the, the first gap is the values gap, right? The second gap is the beliefs gap. The beliefs gap has to do with the fact that there are some things we believe, and I don't mean so much our, our religious beliefs, but things we believe about money and relationships and learning that are just not true. And if we don't change those beliefs to make them consistent with reality, we're going to be unhappy. Now, in America today, there's a belief that whatever you believe, that's okay. That there are no standards. That if you believe it, that's sufficient to make it okay. Well, that's just dumb. Because you can say you don't believe in gravity. It's a free country, right? I don't believe in gravity. Now, if you walk around telling people that, you'll have fewer friends because they think you're nuts. No, I don't believe in it. Well, I can show you. Oh, don't believe. Can't believe your eyes. Oh, don't believe. So, people start thinking you're weird, so you go where people who think they're weird go. Chat rooms on the internet. And you send messages saying, is there anybody out there who doesn't believe in gravity? And all of a sudden, you get all these friends on the internet say, yeah, I don't believe in gravity either. I call them. I'm fine then. Well, after a while, you don't want a virtual friendship. You want a real friendship, so you decide to put together a conference in Newark called People Who Don't Believe in Gravity. People fly in from all over the world. And you set up a conference at a big hotel, and you're going to have an opening event at the hotel so everybody can meet each other. What you're going to do is you're going to go up to the roof of the hotel. Remember, this is the convention of people who don't believe in gravity. You're going to go up to the roof of the hotel, and you're going to all stand on the edge of the roof. You're going to hold hands, and you're going to state your belief. Now, you all believe it. We don't believe in gravity. We don't believe in gravity. We don't believe in gravity. And then you're going to all step off the roof. What will happen? Gravity. No. You'll float in the air. <laughs> because if you believe something, that makes it true. Actually, you won't fly on the air until you look down. Now, this is old anime. For those of you who are young, this is old cartoons. This is old anime. This is Wile E. Coyote. Remember Wile E. Coyote? When he goes off the cliff, he hangs in the air until he looks down. Then he falls. So see, the secret is never to look down. No, I'm just messing with you. It's Caleb. I don't care how many people go to the convention and how strong you may believe there's no such thing as gravity. Gravity will win. In other words, there are certain things that are just true, whether people believe in them or not. These are the foundations of our faith, for example. It doesn't matter how many people don't believe in God. That doesn't mean that God does not exist. So we develop beliefs in life all the time that are not consistent with reality, so we've got to learn how to test our beliefs and maintain our faith. Here's how it works. Everybody here has something called a belief window. It's invisible. You've had it since birth. It's right here. It sits right here in front of you. It's about this tall. It's about this wide. It connects to your head with a cable. Cable's essential because it means when you turn, the window turns. Even if you move quickly, you can't peek around the window. In other words, the outside world only flows through the window. It's been there your whole life. It's right here. From the minute, as very young children, we start to learn things about the world, we write them on the window. Now, we eat broccoli for the first time, we go, oh, don't want to do that again, so we write on the window. This stuff is disgusting. 
And then the next time you see new broccoli through the window, that image gets attached to the old lesson and you go, that's broccoli. What do we know about broccoli? That stuff's disgusting. So we never eat it. Worse, somebody tells us it's disgusting. So I just go, okay, my friend says, got to right on the window. And then you go to like your grandmother's house and she serves broccoli and you say, oh, I don't eat broccoli. Well, what? It's disgusting. Have you ever tried it? See, grandma's always asked this question. Have you ever tried it? No. Then how do you know you hate it? Well, I just do. You see, because once it's on your window, you never test it to see if it's true. You just accept it as true. So there's all kinds of dumb stuff on our window. Stuff about broccoli, stuff about the role of women, the role of men, the role of, in society of religion. I mean, it's all kinds of stuff. Like reading. How many, you're, you're a bright guy. With your busy schedule, how many pages of any book do you probably think you could handle in one? Yeah. Like what would be a real aggressive goal for you? 900? Okay, so 900 pages. How many people here believe that their busy schedule, like this guy, could read 900 pages a month? How many people have tried to read 900 pages a month? Okay, if you, if you believe you can't do it and you've tried it, maybe you can't. But did you see how many people who said, no, I can't read 900 pages a month, and then I said, have you tried it? And they're like, no. <laughs> see, that's, that's your belief window, it's all screwed up. I can't do this, how do you know? I just know. Well, guess what? Once you write something on your window, it controls your life. If you believe you can read 900 pages, you can read 900 pages. Way back in the 1920s, an Englishman was the first person on earth to break the four minute mile, at least a measured four minute mile. Okay? Nobody that we know of up until then had run a four minute mile. In a two week period, two weeks, three other people ran a four minute mile. Now, how do you explain that? They couldn't change their training enough in two weeks to make a difference. They couldn't change their diet. The only thing that changed in the two week period to go from nobody runs a four minute mile to three people run a four minute mile was what? Just the belief. They looked and said, well, if he can do it, I can do it. You ever watch snowboarders, professional snowboarders at the Olympics, for example? Do you realize that it takes crazy adolescents to do that? Because they don't know better. So somebody says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down this hill, it's almost straight down, as fast as you possibly can, then I want you to hit this, this half pipe, and then go up the side, and while you're up there, do like two and a half 360s, and then land it on the back of your board. Well, guess what the first 50 people who get that pitch say? That can't be done, that's insane. And then there's always some guy, you all guys, you all know this, there's always one friend who's like, oh, I'll try. And they go ripping down there, and of course they don't get it done the first one, ten, 100 times, but then they finally land it. And the minute they land it, everybody who sees them land it, their window gets rewritten and they go, it can be done. And then they all line up to go. Because it never had anything to do with reality. It only has to do with the fact that, will you believe it enough to try? A lot of the unhappiness in our lives comes from screwed up things on our belief window. Things that we've never tested for reality. Things like, I can't do this because. I can't do this because I'm too young. I can't do this because I'm too old. I can't do this because I don't have a university degree. I can't do this because I'm female. I can't do this because I'm male. I can't do this because I'm an immigrant. We write all kinds of stuff on our window, and then we just accept it as true. And what then happens is we stop trying. And when we stop trying, we stop growing, and we feel miserable. One of the most important things you can do in life is regularly ask yourself the belief window cleaning question. Ready for the cleaning question? Ready? Why? That's the question. Why? Why can't you do it? Why isn't it allowed? Why can't I do this? Why can't I try this? Why can't I achieve this? Why can't I accomplish this? If the answer is, I don't know, you might want to go find out if that's true or not. See, here's the thing. Most of you are probably really, really bright people. 
Now, how many people here are the parents of at least two children? Parents? Okay. When we're waiting for the birth of our first child, we hope and pray for two things. Always two things. Number one, that the child will be healthy. Ten fingers, ten toes. Number two, that the child will be smart. If we choose to and are able to have a second child or more, we hope and pray for only one thing, that the child will be healthy. Because the idea of smart children is far more attractive than the reality of smart children. You're high maintenance. One of the problems is, is that you start talking early. See, every parent wants their child to talk early until they do. Because God bless you, but once they start talking, what fell in the rest of the sentence? They never stop. So you're exhausting. Bright people are exhausting because all you do is talk. And you don't just talk, you obsess on only one thing. What is the bright child question? Why? That's all you want to know. Why? Why do I have to get up? Why do I have to go to bed? Why do I have to wear this? Why can't I wear this? Why do we eat this? Why don't we eat this? And it drives us out of our minds as your parents. You know why smart kids are obsessed with why? Because they can answer the other three questions on their own because they're smart. They can figure out what, they can figure out how, and they can figure out when. The only thing they want to know is why. But why is the most powerful question in life because everything in life that ever changed started with someone saying, why not? See, this is the, power, the real power question, why not? Because usually what people will say is, well, this, whatever you want to do, has never been done. Okay, so that's a good description of history, but that's not a good description of the future. Well, I want to talk about the future. So you've told me why it has never been done. My question for you is, why not? I mean, it, we're about to get driverless cars. We've been talking about driverless cars for 100 years. But it only takes three or four people who just say, you know what, why don't we just stop talking about it and do it? Why not? You close the belief gap by thinking, why not? By challenging things you've always believed that you never know to be true. Now, some people worry, especially when it comes to our faith, that I will lose my faith if I ask difficult questions. You cannot lose real faith by asking difficult questions. Real faith can stand honest inquiry. Not dishonest inquiry. If you're out to prove something wrong, you can prove it wrong. But if you're out to really know what the truth is, honest faith can stand honest inquiry. But if you're going to change the world, you're going to never change the world by believing things that you've never tested. You've got to try them out. I may not be as busy as you, but I'm pretty busy. I read 3,000 pages a month. So you're reading 30 pages a day, I read 100 pages a day, every day. You know how I get in 100 pages a day every day? I get up at 3 in the morning. You know why I read that much? Because I want to learn. I want to know. I want to understand. You say, what do you read? I said, everything and anything. Right now I was saying, right now I am reading. Now I'm Christian. But right now I am reading this gigantic multi-book set of rabbinical commentary on the book of Genesis. It'll take me about three years to get through it. But I'm learning all cool kinds of cool things about Genesis. And people are like, who cares? Just go, you know, just read Genesis. Like, no, I want to see another perspective on it. And no kidding, it's like this thing. But it's really, really good. And I'm having a lot of fun. And it beats playing video games. <laughs> You can play video games when you have spare time. And I'm sure you have lots of spare time. <laughs> okay, so that's the beliefs gap. The values gap is where you start investing in what matters most to you. That'll make you happy. The beliefs gap is where you start asking why not. And you begin to make changes in the world because you choose to make changes. That'll make you happy. Make the rest of us happy too because you'll change the world. That'll be fun. I'm excited for driverless cars. I've driven cars long enough. I'm perfectly content to sit in the back seat. I don't mind if the computer drives it. I think it's going to be awesome. 
The third gap is the time gap. This is the, uh, the final place where most people are unhappy. They're unhappy because they say the following. Adults spell this in for me. How many? Because adults say this all the time. You ready? I don't have, finish it. Time. Enough time. Okay, we have to go back to fourth grade science now for the adults. Go way back to fourth grade science. What determines the length of the day? Fourth grade science. Close, that's the length of the year. Close, go one more. A rotation of the earth, perfect. The earth rotates around its own axis once every 24 hours. Correct, scientists? And here's the thing. You and I are on the same earth, correct? At the beginning of a rotation. And we're on the same earth at the end of a rotation, correct? Which means how many hours did you get? How many hours did I get? But when a person says, I don't have enough time, there's an underlying assumption that other people are getting more. They're not. Everybody gets to go for the whole ride. You get 24 hours every day. So how does this person next to you get so much done? Well, first of all, they stop whining about not having enough time. We have all the time there is. That's the first key to closing the time gap is stop thinking you're going to get more. You're not. That's it. We're talking on the way down about life. You know, the reality is that we all have a measured amount of time. God knows that we don't. And because we don't, there isn't all the time that's allotted to us. That's just the simple reality. Second thing you have to do to close the time gap is you have to stop thinking about time. Now, anybody here a quantum physicist? Anybody here an aspirational quantum physicist? Because I'm about to say something that is not correct according to quantum physics, but is correct according to relativity theory. In other words, Einstein would agree with this statement because it's his. But if you're a quantum physicist, you won't like it. Here we go. Einstein said, time is a continuum. What's a continuum? Something that goes on forever, right? It continues in this direction for eternity and in this direction for eternity. Time is a continuum in which events succeed one another from past through present to future. See, the quantum physicists don't like that because they think time moves in multiple directions, not just one. But that's for the physicists we can meet later. Time is a continuum in which events succeed one another from past through present to future. What's an event? Everything that happens. A breath is an event. A meeting is an event. A birthday is an event. A thought is an event. Our days are made up of millions of events. And they're occurring in a line called past, present, and future. Here's why this quote matters. I want you to stop worrying about time and start thinking about events in this way. Now you need to draw a model. You ready to draw it with me? You need a half a sheet of paper, so wherever you are, make sure you got at least a half a sheet of paper. You need to leave two inches of space above and below the line I now want you to write. I want you to draw a line from the left side of the page to the right. Or if you're doing it in Arabic, you can go from the right side to the left. Whichever way you're comfortable with. Now, on the far left side of the line, just above the line, but on the far left side, would you write the word happy? Above the line on the left side. Happy. And directly below the word happy, on the other side of the line, the word unhappy. So now for the business people in the room, we have two rows on our spreadsheet, right? Happy row, unhappy row. Now we're going to create three columns that are going to intersect those rows. So, above the line and higher than the word happy, write the word, the phrase, no control. So the first column after happy is going to be titled, no control. Then go across to the middle of the page and right on the same level, write the phrase, some control. So you've got a no control column, now you've got a some control column. Therefore, on the far right, you will have a total control column. So now we have a spreadsheet, right? 
Three columns, no sum and total, by two rows, happy and unhappy. Does that make sense? This is exactly right. I'm now going to show you how to be happy regardless of the amount of time you have in life. Give me some examples of things in life that no matter how hard you try, you have no control over. No matter how hard you try, no control. Traffic. Traffic. Weather. By the way, I want you to listen carefully to this because you stress out way too much about time. <laughs> Traffic. No control. Weather. No control. Other person. Other people. Are you a father? Yes. Then you better hope it's not no control. <laughs> because otherwise you've wasted your time. <laughs> How much control do we have over the passage of time? The turning of the clock. No control. All right, here we go. Whenever during the day you confront something over which you have no control, you have two options. Write this word under the heading no control on the happy side of the line. You ready? Here's the word. Adapt. A-D-A-P-T. Adapt. What does the word adapt mean? Just change, get used to it, roll with it, adjust to it. Now below the line, on the unhappy side, in the same column, here's your other choice. Wine. W-H-I-N-E. Wine. Miserable. Guess what? It takes as much energy to whine about things you have no control over as it does to adapt to them. If you chose the wrong road when you had the option to go in two directions and you passed that exit, let it go. <laughs> you just have to adapt. Whining just consumes energy. It consumes emotional energy, physical energy. You know how much time most of us, including me, spend whining about things we can't control in life? A lot. It's a waste of energy. Just roll with it. Years ago, I was a Boy Scout leader, and so I got all these uh, 11 to 13 year olds, and we're hiking in a very, very, Utah has very aggressive wilderness. You need to pay attention. So I said to these kids, because you know, they always want to go way up front. I said, you can go ahead on one condition, that you do not leave the path. Under no condition, leave the path. So they decided to be strictly obedient and take me literally at my word. And a little while later, they all come back and they said, we can't go any further. I said, well, of course you can. I've, I've hiked this trail many times. It's about another four or five miles. They said, but we can't go any further. I said, why not? They said, well, there's a tree in the middle of the path. I said, go around the tree. They said, we can't. You told us not to leave the path. <laughs> I'm like, what's some common sense here, guys? Seriously, just walk around the tree. Do you know how many trees pop up in a day? And people go, oh, I can't go any farther. I'm waiting for approval, I'm waiting for budget, I'm waiting for this. Go around the tree. How many of you are immigrants to the United States? I'm an immigrant to the United States. I immigrated from Canada. It took me 19 years to get my green card. Guess how you do that? You adapt. You roll with it, you adjust to it, accommodate it. You hand in paperwork and they send it back and they say it's wrong. Well, you can sit there and feel sorry for yourself for a week or you can redo the paperwork. To be successful in life, you have to learn how to adapt. Now, go to some control. Okay, I'm back to you. What do you have some control over? Same answer. <laughs> some control. Kids. Kids. You have some control at best over your kids. How much control do your parents have over you? Zero. Well, as much as your kids right? So if you have some control, how much control do you have over them? You have a lot. I'm going to show you how. I'm going to show you how to have control. Okay. What do we have some control over? This is the biggest part of life. Anything that involves other people. Anytime other people are involved, you have at most some control because they want some control. Parents want control over their children. Children want control over their parents. Bosses want control over their workers. Workers want control over their bosses. I mean, it's just how it works. Stephen Covey, by the way, called that win-win. That's all win-win is, is that I get some control so I can win, and you get some control so you can win. That's all it is. Well, here are your two options. Here's the happy option for some control. Influence. See, I can't actually 
over the long term control my children. They will eventually become adults. They will go out and they will pursue their own life. And no matter how much control I thought I had, I no longer have it. So what I need to do is stop controlling my children and start influencing my children. Why? So in the hope that when they leave, they'll be wise enough and they'll still love me enough to do what I told them to do. Because you see, if I control them, they only do what I told them to do while they're present. Then the minute that I'm not there, they rebel. Influence is the only effective tool we have in life. Now, what goes in the unhappy side under some control? Manipulate. Manipulate. I'm now going to speak to all the daughters in the room. You ready? Because you can master this and think that you figured life out. My daughter Rachel has only to hint that she's sad for me to find any way to give her anything she wants. If it sounds like she's about to cry, I will move heaven and earth to get her what she wants. My son Jonathan could care less. He can cry all day long. That's just how daughters are with dads. See, I don't know that this is right or wrong, but the reality is this. We love our wives, but we love our daughters more. It's just how it works. You have a tremendous amount of power over your dads. You can get us to do all kinds of things just by saying, What's the matter? Like, how much do you need? <laughs> but if you're a son, don't try that because I'll say, you know what? You need to buck up and be a man. You need to learn to take responsibility. But dad, oh, be quiet, Jonathan. You'll be quiet. <laughs> Rachel just cried to pay the money. You can manipulate your parents, but only short term. See, the difference between an influence and manipulation is manipulation works short term, influence works long term. Total. I'm told. Yourself? Now, do you think if I have total control over me, when God was putting a body on my spirit, I would have not said, I like the Brad Pitt model. <laughs> I don't have total control over me. This is not what I would have chosen if I had total control. Your, your actions. Let's make it even a little broader. Your choices. You have total control over your choices. Now people say, well, that's not true. It is, actually. I can, for example, punch you in the head. There's nothing to prevent me from doing that other than that there will be consequences I don't want to trigger. Three consequences minimum. Right? I hit you. You're much more fit than me. You will now hit me back. Number two, he will kick me out of here and never talk to me again. Number three, someone will call the police and I'll spend the night in jail. See, it's not that I can't do it. It's that I choose not to because I don't want to trigger certain consequences. April 15th is coming up. People say, no, I hate having to pay taxes. No, I have to pay taxes. You'll go to prison. That's the consequence, but you don't have to do anything. Here are the two choices for total control. The happy choice, act. ACT, act. Do something, make a choice. You know, the worst thing you can do as a parent if you have children is on a weekend night you say, you know, since it's the weekend, rather than cook, we'll go out to eat. That's fine, that's fine to do that. Here's where you make the mistake. The parents then say to the children, where do you want to eat? And if there are five children, there will now be five choices. And then everybody gets stressed out because nobody wants to make a choice. Well, let's go here, but I don't want to go here. Well, we'll go here, but I hate the man. Just don't ask, seriously. <laughs> Just say, we are going here. <laughs> well, I don't like that. Okay, we'll leave you home and you can find something. No, then don't no, come, no, trust me. You act. What's the opposite of act? What's the unhappy option? Procrastinate. Procrastinate. Right, they give you an assignment at school. Yes? Your intentions, once they become conscious. This is a very good question, so let me answer it. I've had people say, well, do I have total control over my emotions? I think you have to divide emotions, like you would intentions, into two pieces. The occurrence, or the 
initial act of an emotion. So, you know, people will say, well, he makes me angry. Well, that will be the initial occurrence of the emotion. I don't know if you have any total control over that. It just happens. The persistence of it is totally within your control. In other words, making me angry might be something I have no control over. Acting on that anger is something I have total control over. Does that make sense? So that was a good question. Now here's how you become happy in life. Stop whining, manipulating, and procrastinating. Start adapting, influencing, and acting. It takes as much energy to live below the line as it does to live above the line. It's a choice. You can choose to be Eeyore, or you can choose to be Tigger. And people say, well, Richard, it really depends on your circumstances, doesn't it? No. I know very happy poor people and very miserable rich people. I know people who are doing whatever they want to in life and are miserable, and people who are trying to discipline and control their life who are incredibly happy people. Mormons, like Muslims, do not drink alcohol. And everybody says, well, how do you have fun without alcohol? I said, we actually have a lot of fun and we don't wake up throwing up. It's kind of a cool way to live. You've got to live above the line. Now, those of you who are really smart, you think you found a flaw in this model. And that's in the sum control one because you're like, but Richard, you can't always influence people. You can't always influence your children. Children can't influence their parents. So what do you do if you can't influence people? When our daughter Rachel was 14, she came to me and she said, Dad, I'm going to pierce my eyebrow and pierce my navel. And I'm a very conservative person, so this was a problem. But I decided instead of being confrontational, I would ask her a few questions. So I said, Rachel, Thanks for bringing me up to speed, by the way. Uh, she was 14, she's starting the 19th, 9th grade. I said, are you planning to have a part-time job while you're in school, like you all talk about? Absolutely. And when you graduate from high school, you're planning to go to a really good college and get a scholarship. Absolutely. I said, then you can't pierce your eyebrows. She said, why not? I said, because old people run the world. She said, what does that mean? I said, old people like me decide who gets jobs, who gets scholarships and who gets admissions? I still don't understand. We don't like facial piercing. Well, that's not fair. I said, Rachel, I'm not telling you what's fair. I'm telling you how life works. You're telling me that even if I had great grades? I said, yeah. Well, that's just ridiculous. So then, because she thinks she's smart, she said, they won't see my navel. See, she thinks she's beating me at my own game. So I said, I could forbid you to pierce your navel, but I'm going to give you counsel. It's a bad idea. But if you choose to do it, I guess you can do it. But I'm going to give you counsel. It's a bad idea. Here's the best part. You ready? She pierced her navel. It got badly infected. She was in pain for weeks. I love it. <laughs> she then took it out, and we never had a problem with it again. <laughs> See, here's what you do. If you can't influence a person, you have to do what they call pick your fights. And you might have chosen to do it differently than I did. I'm not saying I did it the right way. But you have to decide, if a person's not open to influence, will you adapt, which is roll with it, or will you act, which would be forbidden? If Rachel had come to me and said, I'm going to a party and we're going to be drinking, I would try to influence her, first of all, by explaining why that would be a very good, bad idea. But if she said, I'm doing it anyway, I would act. I would prevent her from going. I would not let her harm herself. She's too immature to make that decision. So you pick your fights. What's the right answer? I don't know. Welcome to making choices. But I do know this. Once you create all this energy, don't waste it. Don't waste your energy in life whining about things you can't control. Oh, I wish I was taller. I wish I was skinnier. I wish I had bigger feet. I wish I had smaller feet. Can you tell I've raised girls? I wish this, I wish that. I'm like, let it go. You are what you are. You're beautiful as you are. I wish I had hair. That'd be awesome. I did. It was a long, long time ago. These are the three gaps. The values gap. 
The gap is created when you don't do what matters most to you. You close the gap by knowing and living your values. The beliefs gap is created by believing things you've never really looked at. I hate broccoli. You know, before you decide you hate broccoli, eat some broccoli. Then if you still hate it, that's fine. But you might decide to like it. The time gap is created by worrying about time rather than worrying about events. As you go through the day, just ask yourself two very simple questions. Here are the two questions. How much control do I have over wherever I am? There's only three possible answers. No, sum in total. Once you decide your level of control, then say, how do I keep or remain happy? The answer is simple. No control, how do you remain happy? You adapt. Some control, how do you remain happy? You influence. Total control, how do you remain happy? You act. The minute you start whining, manipulating, and procrastinating, you are guaranteed unhappiness. Your life will not work. Now, in conclusion, these are all ideas. The first thing you need to do with knowledge is test it against that which you know to be true. Where can you find out what is and isn't true? In those three relationships. I don't care whether you're being taught physics or whether you're being taught morality. You find truth by testing it against three relationships. One, you take it to God. Two, you take it to your parents and those who have more experience than you. And three, you think about it, ponder it, pray about it yourself. If it will pass all three tests, it may not be totally true, but it's sufficiently true for you to act on. But you just don't simply take something that somebody says, you just met me two hours ago and I'm up here running my mouth. The worst thing you could do is actually just go do this. Because what if I'm wrong? I don't mind being tested. Test me. Take it to God. Take it to your parents. Honor it yourself. And then if you're confident through those witnesses that it's true, then do it. And learn from your mistakes and you'll get better over time. But do it. Here's my favorite Hiram Smith quote. Character is the commitment. Character is the commitment to carry out a worthy decision after the emotion of making that decision is passed. I'll repeat it. Character is the commitment to carry out a worthy decision after the emotion of making that decision has passed. We've all had experiences where we've heard something that we know to be true, that we know would make us happier, that we know, we know would make the world better, and in the emotion of the moment we go, I'm going to change. I'm going to improve. I'm going to do this. And then very quickly we get caught up in the busyness of life and the emotion goes away and we fall back into old habits. The only thing that allows us to change is character. We must keep pushing through. Now let me build on Hiram's quote with the last thing that I'll say and then I'll thank you for your time. I was speaking at a Boy Scout encampment about six years ago. I get invited back every year because I said something that was really surprising to some people until they thought about it. I stood up in front of about a thousand Boy Scouts and I said, I'm going to tell you something, you know, at 12 to 14 years old. I'm going to tell you something nobody's ever told you before. So I need you to listen very carefully because it's going to freak you out. I said, you're not special. I said, the world keeps telling you guys you're special, that you're unique. And since it was a religious group of Boy Scouts, I said, let me remind you about something. If you go back and read the creation story, you will find a very interesting pattern. On days one through five of the creation, God commands the elements to do something. Separate the light from the darkness. Separate the land from the waters. Bring forth fruit and herbs. When he creates man, he does not command. He takes of the dust of the earth and forms Adam. This is interesting because it is both 
an intimate act, we are created by God into man, into the man Adam. But it's also a nothingness act because we are made out of dust. So it tells us two things. We are very special to God and we are nothing. And I think that's very important to remember. It's, it's, by the way, when you, when you spend three years reading the book of Genesis over and over and over again, you finally notice that. <laughs> so guess what? You are special to God and to your parents. We love you. But you're not that special. You're made of dust. You came from dust. We're going back to dust. So get over yourselves. So I said to these scouts, I said, now let me, under, let me make clear what I mean by this. You're not special, but you're sufficient. We are all sufficient to whatever we put our minds to. You have a phrase in Arabic that we don't use in Christianity. It's the perfect definition of the difference between special and, and uh, sufficient. You know what it is? Insha'Allah. God willing. You put, your, you're, you put your mind to something, God willing, you can do it. But know this, you can't do it on your own. So, you, so I said, so let me help you here with doing that which God wills you to do. Number one, about 10% of success in life comes from talent. That's all. So if you have talent, get over yourself. It's only 10%. If you have no talent, stop worrying about it. It's only 10%. Now in business we say, at least 20% of life is just showing up. You know, just hard work, dedication, get out of bed. I agree, it's about 20% of life. So now we've used up how much? 30, right? 10% for your talent, 20% for just showing up. What's the other 70%? Character. Just gutting it out. I'll use a Marine Corps word. Just gutting it out. You get up and you get it done. You have no money, you find a way to pay the bills. You can't pay the, the electric bill, you find a way to keep the lights on. You find a way to feed your family. You find a way to get things done that you get done. And as you just gut it out, you will develop character. And as you develop character, you'll be kind of people that can make a difference in the world. Yes, sir? 20% is just showing up. Getting out of bed, brushing your teeth, getting on the bus. But 70% of life is just discipline, it's just hard work. If you go back and talk to your grandparents or older people, especially if they made the great sacrifice to immigrate, they will tell you about how hard that is. And guess how they did it? There was nothing special going on. They weren't special. They just did it. You keep the lights on for today, and then you try to keep them on for tomorrow. You put food in the fridge today, and you try to put food in the fridge tomorrow. You get ready for today's exam, don't worry about tomorrow's exam. You'll have tomorrow to worry about tomorrow's exam. Character is important. So in summary, here's how it works. You want to be happy in life? Build three re relationships. Your relationship with God will give you humility. Your relationship with your elders will grant you wisdom. Your relationship with yourself will grant you insight. You will learn who you are. <coughs> On those three relationships, build three disciplines. Live your values. Challenge your beliefs. And respond to events above the line. And then when all is said and done, just gut it out. Because character is the discipline to carry out a worthy decision after the emotion of making the decision has passed. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you so much. And I hope like we learned not one lesson, a lot of lessons. And I think he put it nicely when he said how many of you are happy. And I think I don't want to share the number, but it's not ten. And and I heard you know Hiram Smith in the past and I said the same thing, you know, that character that I gotta do this. And that that moment you do it. But three months later you shift away. Right? I think we just have to remind ourselves about all these lessons, about all these gaps, and try to close that gap.
We thank you so much. Uh, I just don't want to say something. Um, you know, Hiram is, as we say, is in the hospital, right? So we pray Allah that he recovers quickly and he gets back to his family as soon as possible. We brought him a card that I hope everybody signs it. And the card, I'm going to read it, uh, what it says. He's a very active person, very, very active. So this is the opposite of active. Halazuna, it's a snail. So he said, it says, slowing down can be tough from someone as on the go as you. But right now, a, cha a chance to recover is just what you need. Thinking of you and wishing you well. So please sign it, I will send it to him. And another thing, I gotta look after this one. Hey then, your turn. Get the... Do you wanna bring the... Just for one second, I'm just gonna videotape this one if you don't mind. I want you all to say... I want you all to say, Hiram, we miss you and we wish you well. Go ahead. Hi, we miss you and we wish you well. All right. Woohoo! One more thing. Just one more thing. Uh, I think we have another one of our youth participants. He wants to say something, I guess. You guys. Richard. Oh, yeah. So, hey, what are we, what's going on? Well, let me Thank you. This is from our Moroccan community. It's gorgeous. I don't know how you're going to get it to uh, on that. We're We're wrapped up. We'll take it, you know. It is beautiful. You know, we were talking about decorative arts, and we were talking about the commandment that thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And so I love the decorative arts. Thank you.